Appreciate you turning out on a stormy Texas night. Uh, I'm enjoying myself here. Feel that you are my people. So, um, I don't want to revisit what we talked about this morning. I understand it was all recorded anyway, so any of you missed it, you can go back and, uh, and have a listen to that. But to one of the things we said this morning was that, that one of the great um, sadnesses of the emerging development of the thing that we call the Christian faith is that we have, we have shaped our thinking by looking back at the Bible, not by going back to the beginning and looking forward through the Bible. The consequence of that is that we impose onto the text and we impose onto the narrative ideas and thoughts that, that relate to our developed experience in the 21st century rather than the idea and the concept and the revelation that was seeking to reveal itself when that scripture was the word made flesh. And... Um, so the problem with that is that we, we then fail to appreciate what I would say is the full extent of the more beautiful gospel. And so we've turned what should be news into not news, and we've turned what should be good into not being good. And in doing that, we, we in some way dishonor the essence of what the gospel has always been. Even our views of the cross, what the cross means, what Jesus' death means, for, for all of us in here, uh, of most, most of us, if not all of us, have been infected by an idea that until 500 years ago was not how the work of the cross was perceived. It, it's known as penal substitutionary atonement, and it was not a thing until 500 years ago um, after Martin Luther's Reformation and particularly through guys like uh, John Calvin and Theodore Betzer and, and certain characters in that time. That was a developed idea from 500 years before that which came from a guy called Anselm of Canterbury in 1076 um, who had a version of that theory of atonement but Anselm's theory was not the common held theory. And uh, as you go back to to the very earliest parts of the early church, you find that how we have perceived and understood even the cross and salvation and the gospel was actually not how they would have seen it. They would have been quite shocked to talk to many of us now if we were to tell them what we believe the cross meant and, 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 and the sacrifice of Jesus. What is also interesting is that for the first two centuries, um, the, those early believers were more gripped by the resurrection than they were by the crucifixion. They saw the crucifixion as important, it had a context, but they did not see the crucifixion in the way that we would now come and bow down to the cross, was not in their concept of understanding. They believed the cross was a once for all work of God in Christ through Jesus, the word made flesh, that when he said it is finished, it was finished. So there was no simply to the cross I cling. You know, the, all, all the hymns that we have about, you know, about the, the cross, they, they were not there. See, the issue with them was that, that at the time of Jesus, there were at least, at least another 30 messiahs on the scene during the 33 years that Jesus was on the earth. So they were not unfamiliar with claims of messiahship. Um, they were not unfamiliar with messiahs being taken by the authorities. They were not unfamiliar with messiahs being crucified. They were unfamiliar with messiahs rising from the dead. So the cross was not different to them. The crucifixion was not different. It was significant and it had meaning. And that meaning can be understood as we look through the scriptures, not back at the scriptures, imposing our theories on there. It can be understood. But for them, the miracle was Christ is risen. He was alive. And so for the first 200 years, um, the, the, the community of believers were known for their joy, not their misery, 
not their judgmentalism, not their condemnation, not their high-minded superiority, not their tribalism. They were known for their joy and that's why it spread through, through the religious Roman world then it spread because of this infectious nature of the organic joy that, that had come. And uh, the truth is you cannot find, um, even on a tomb, you know they buried people in the catacombs back then, particularly those who were believers. And uh, in the catacombs of Rome, the first recorded marking of a cross on a tomb did not occur until 415 AD with a particular lady who happened to be of Roman noble background and that was the first time in the 400s where, where you see a cross on a tomb because they were not clinging to the cross. They believed what Christ did, he finished, it was finished for all time, for all creation, forever, and now we lived in newness of life. So now we come from Jesus, the one who saves, into Christ, who is the expressed anointing of all of heaven, who has been from all time before and will be for all time to come. And that, that's, that's another thing we'll talk about for another day going beyond Jesus, which you might think, how can you go beyond Jesus? You have to go beyond Jesus because that's not where it's at. It's not Jesus in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you because there's something beyond. Now, that, I'm just teasing you there for, so I'll get invited back and we can talk about some more, some more stuff. Um, so because of this, we our interpretation of things becomes distorted and then we do not understand the models and patterns that give us revelation within the context of the text that we call scripture. We, we don't appreciate that there are literary styles and there are cultural synonyms that are critical to understanding what not only the text is saying, but what is the trajectory of the message. So, so if we don't impose upon the text, upon the narrative, all of our ideas now looking back, our junk, but we try to go back pure and come forward and say, okay, let's, let's try to not hang junk on this, which we tend to do, don't we? Um, we have made serving Christ very complicated when it's supposed to be very simple. We, we've all been under the pressure of expectation and Jesus said, you guys need to take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's what rabbis did. You took on the rabbi's yoke and you became yoked to the rabbi. They saw Jesus as a rabbi. He said, he said I want you to take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if it's become heavy and difficult, my question is, to whom are you yoked? And part of our problem on that, if we've become so devil obsessed, so demonic spirits obsessed, so spiritual warfare obsessed, that we say on one hand that every knee bowed at the name of Jesus, when he died, he said it is finished, and then we, we, we give power to all these things to where you would believe actually the power of Satan and the power of evil is, you know, God might just survive if he's lucky. And we'll, we'll try and help him by doing a little fasting and praying. He may just make it. I want to tell you, it's the other way around. We spend far too much time obsessed with what we believe is evil and the devil rather than just being obsessed with it is finished, he is enthroned, he is in all and through all and everything has its existence in him and we're trying to find that space, not where we go to heaven, but where heaven and earth are one. So in view of that, I, I just want to throw a couple of, of um, scenarios to you because these are important of whether we're looking back and imposing our ideas on them, or we're looking forward through them. So, throughout Scripture, this, this idea of, of blood and the shedding of blood has been perpetrated from early days. Now, um, 
it's, it's probably a God thing. You say, what do you mean probably? Well, the whole idea of blood has been important to humanity and human culture from as long as and as far as we can go back. And um, in that context, blood was the, was, the, was the most valuable currency in the context of covenant and promise. The, the, you, the greatest promise you could make would be through a covenant of blood. So blood was not just a sacrificial thing. Blood was perceived back then as a valuable commodity, more valuable than gold and silver when it came to relationships. If we would bleed together, we would never be separated. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the um, um, God making a covenant with himself, of which Abraham was the beneficiary this morning of the animals and walking through and all that stuff. Um, Again, lots we could say about that, but, but one little issue I wanted to raise. Two, two, uh, two things from, from the Genesis narrative, because I said, you know, as, as we learned in, from the wisdom of, um, of uh, the sound of music, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start, and it really is. So, we have this issue with blood, and, and we need to understand a little bit, because if we are committed to what it is that we say we believe then we know that when Jesus died on the cross it was it was a blood event okay and we know that there are scriptures about the shedding of blood and and blood in scripture again our superimposed ideas looking back can distort sometimes what they truly mean and leave us with more guilt than peace which is never meant to be that way so, so we know that blood is a commodity that's talked about. So th there is a principle in, in, in study of scripture that's called the, 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 it's called the principle of first mention, the law of first mention. And, and basically what that means is if you want to begin to understand something from its, from its purest root, if, if you want to get to the source of that river to the spring from which it flows so that you can know the purity of that water before it ever gets polluted downstream and corrupted. If you want to take a drink at the source, you have to kind of look at where's this first mention? Where does this first pop out of the rock? And so there is this question about the shedding of blood. And the question is, when is the shedding of blood first mentioned? In the Bible. Now, for those of you who have never heard me preach, those of you who have heard me talk about this, shut up. <laughs> you see, most people believe that the first mention of the shedding of blood is after this event that we call the fall, which is never called the fall in Scripture, at which we believe man became so corrupted with sin that God was so angry with him that God separated himself from him and chucked him out the garden and that was the end of that until Jesus came, which is nonsense. That's, that's a looking back superimposed to try and reinforce what in essence is a, is a gospel of control and manipulation, threat, fear, intimidation. How many of you know there is no fear in love? Perfect love drives out fear. So anything anybody tries to preach to you that puts fear on you is not only not a message of love, but it is not the heart of the one who is love himself. Fear has no place in our gospel. I have to be honest, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer not because I deeply loved this character I was being presented called Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. So you say, what kind of relationship is it that's driven by fear and fear that the one who's not going to send you to hell is going to beg his dad who's decided he's going to send you to hell because he's mad with you not to send you to hell when he created the problem in the first place? So, so when we look back, the problem is we then superimpose and say, the first mention of the shedding of blood is when Adam ate from the tree... And, uh, you know, he, he suddenly became aware that he was naked. And, um, and so God made 
made garments of skins to cover their nakedness because he was now ashamed. Now, even that story is very interesting because um, I love God's question. Who told you that you were naked? Where did you get the idea, Adam, that you're a problem to me? I didn't tell you that. Who told you? You've been naked ever since I made you. I only see you naked. You can't hide that nakedness. I know everything about you. Who told you that you were naked? You see, once we drop into the mind a problem, often that problem has been created by how we see ourselves, not how God sees us. And then we do this disservice of going into the world and telling people this is how God sees you when actually that's not how God sees them at all. It's how we see ourselves and then we project that onto others because, yeah, shame is a natural response to when we feel that we have failed or not met the mark. But shame is not a factor to separate us from God. And so when God provided garments to cover Adam and Eve, it was not because God was embarrassed at their condition. He realized they were embarrassed at their condition. So whatever was provided was not for God's benefit, it was for their benefit. He didn't need nothing to die. He didn't need to kill anything, but he said, I'll do you a favor. There's an issue in this, in this death of this, and we presume it was a lamb, but we don't know. You know, I mean, if it was warm, sheepskin was going to be fairly... So maybe it was a cow, I don't know, and a nice leather jacket. But the, if you believe God did that for his benefit, you have misunderstood the idea. Most of the provision that we see was never for God's benefit in the first place because God doesn't have a problem with us, we have a problem with ourselves. But his grace gives us what we need so we can deal with our own shame, but the way God sees us has never changed. So from the beginning, none of this issue of blood was ever about changing how God sees you. It was only ever changing how you see God. Because how God sees you didn't need changing. We didn't need the blood of Jesus so God would look kindly upon us. We needed the blood of Jesus so we would look kindly upon ourselves and then see God has always looked kindly upon us, and then we enter into that relationship. So so most people and most preachers will preach that as this is the first mention of the shedding of blood, but they're wrong. And I was wrong for many years. You see, that's in the end of Genesis chapter 3, but how many of you know Genesis chapter 2 happens before Genesis chapter 3? And in the end of Genesis chapter 3, there's another story. And it says that, that um, God saw that the man was alone. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for the man. So it says, so God put the man to sleep. And out of his side, he removed a rib. And from the rib, he made the woman that he brought to the man and said, now you two, this is going to be good. You're going to be one flesh. Now, The whole thing of of Adam and Eve being provided with garments of skins, there is nothing in chapter 3 that says an animal was killed. It just says God provided garments of skin. So by, by implication, we presume blood was shed because they got the skins. So it doesn't specifically say so. So by that same rule of implication, when you cut someone open to remove a rib, what happens? That person bleeds. And so out of that shedding of blood was taken a rib and the rib was used to create something that would be very important in the journey of the human. So don't you find it fascinating that when Jesus, the last of Adam's generation, because we are no longer of Adam, we're of Christ, When Jesus was on the cross, that they didn't break any bones, but what they did, the centurion thrust a spear in his side, and out of his side flowed blood and water. You see, what was happening in the natural in Genesis chapter 2 was happening in the 
spiritually Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And out of the side of Jesus spiritually a rib was being removed in all of that blood to create a woman to bring to the man. We know that woman as the church and we know that man as Jesus the bridegroom, Christ the bridegroom that those two then together would be the propagators of our new generation that would fill the whole earth with the glory of God. So the first mention of the shedding of blood, if you believe it was the skins, then you will believe that the shedding of blood was to fix a problem. And every time you see the shedding of blood, you'll believe this is to fix a problem, this is to fix a problem. Therefore, there must be a problem. Even if I don't know what the problem is, there is a problem. So I might not be able to name it, but there's definitely a problem. There's definitely sin, there's definitely error, there's definitely wrongdoing, if you see it that way. But if you actually go back to the first dimension, you begin to believe that the shedding of blood was to create a purpose, not fix a problem. So now it's not a repair solution, now it's a creation opportunity. So out of that blood, something is made that is powerful, that has life, and that brings forth and multiplies. So do you see how if we look back with the wrong emphasis and impose upon it, what we begin to see takes us down the wrong path. Now it doesn't mean God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean his work doesn't work for us or his salvation is not good. It just means we're unlikely to experience my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What we're likely to finish up with is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. You guys... You put burdens on men's backs and you don't lift a finger to help them and you turn them into twice the sons of hell that you are. That's a bit startling, isn't it? So so what we have emerging when we when we come here and we look forward through is is we get a different model, we get a different understanding of blood, we get a different understanding of the purpose of that blood and now we begin to get an optimistic and positive outlook on the world and humanity rather than a pessimistic and destructive outlook. Now I'm going to reinforce that a little bit by talking to you for a few moments about about the, um, the literary pattern of Genesis 1 and 2. Or you might say what you mean by a literary pattern. You see, if you, if you don't look at ancient cultures and ancient history, you will always struggle to put the Bible into context. Now, I don't just mean the context of when did Abraham live, you know, when did all this happen? I mean, I mean a context of understanding what is really being said. So, you know, I stick my neck out and say, Genesis 1 and into the beginning of chapter 2, has got nothing to do with a scientific understanding of how the earth came to being. Now, if you believe that, if you're a six-day creationist, that's fine. I have have no problem. That's okay. Um, I'm not sure where I sit on that because it doesn't matter. Now you say, what do you mean it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter because there is a greater message within it than trying to prove God made the earth in six literal days. Now, no problem with that, but the message is bigger than that. Now, let me illustrate. In in the literary style of the surrounding cultures, when, when, when this part of the Bible was, not only when this part of the Bible was written... But the era about which this was written, because you know this, this wasn't written as it was happening, okay? It was written much later, and, and some of these writings didn't happen until one of the Jewish captivities. So, so they're looking back, taking oral tradition and then writing down. Um, and, and this is not questioning the integrity of Scripture. This is just saying it is what it is, so don't make it what it isn't. That's what happened. If you don't like it, you just got to get over it. But that's what happened. So there's a literary style that was going on. And you see those literary styles and models mirrored in the writings of Scripture for the reason that 
those people with that cultural understanding will grasp the point that is being made because it's a familiar way of saying things. So, in many of those writings from this same era of when we would understand Genesis to have taken place, the cultures around would write thesis and the thesis would be about the construction of the temple for their God. So right from the beginning, people, as I said to you this morning, have been asking the question, who is God, what is God, where is God, what the heck is all this about? And love the hearts, some of them brought some wisdom and some of them brought some nonsense, a bit like now. There's some wisdom talked about in churches, there's some nonsense talked about in churches. And so in this style, there was, there was a familiar style across these cultures and, and, and the religions, Akkadians, Sumerians, Mesopotamians, these kind of things, and of course, you know, the, the bleed through of Egyptian culture and, and many of these. And there was this style where they would write about the construction of the temple and they would detail it in steps. So in, in, in the way that they would say, this is what happened on the first day and this is what happened on the second day. And this is what happened on the third day. And then the very last thing that they would write about was once the temple had finished being constructed, the last thing they would write about would be the bringing of the image of the God into the temple. So you would bring the idol, the image of the God, and you would set it in the temple that you had built, but that would be the last thing that you would do, and that would be the last thing that they would write about. So Genesis 1 follows that literary pattern and we have a day one and a day two and a day three and stuff's being made and what is happening is in that literary style he's saying God built a temple and he called it the world and these are what happened and this is what was put in the temple and this is how the temple looked and the last thing that he did was put the image of the God in the temple. You are that image. You see, we, we've romantically used the term we were made in the image and the likeness of God. As you know, we, we kind of, you know, God just sort of, you know... It's far more important than that. You are far more special than that. The last thing that happened, you would bring the image of the God and set the image in the temple. The last thing that was set in the temple of the world was the image of the man, Adam and the woman, Eve. Let's call them humanity. So God was saying humanity is important. Your humanity is important. Your existence as a human being is important. You are the image of God in the world and you need to celebrate your humanity, not curse your humanity and allow your humanity to express what the creator of the image put within you so that let your light so shine... So in the temple, the image God wanted was not some idol of some imaginary shape of the divine. It was you. It's your shape. It's my shape. It's your face. It's my face. We became the image in the temple. Now, now in those days reading this, you would put some weight on creation. But then, the, I love these creation stories. You know, one group of, of um, indigenous people, we came out of a clamshell. If you've ever watched the movie Smallfoot, they were pooped out of the butt of the great, the great, um, the great ox. What I'm trying to get through to you is, is how this all came to being is not the point. What it represents is the point. And this was representing to the people of those cultures something with which they were familiar that they could say, now this is different. Because as you track this through history, you see the image of the God in the temple was always an idol. 
of gold, silver, clay, wood. But the image in God's temple was never an idol. It was always flesh, human flesh. And when the word himself came in the temple, he did not come in the form of an idol. The word was made flesh and lived among us and we saw the glory of the Father. Again, a son of Adam was manifesting his humanity in the temple which was the world so that from that temple the life that put the image in the temple would flow into all the world and the glory of the Lord would fill the whole earth like the waters cover the sea. Because the earth is actually filled with the glory of the Lord. It's just we are not seeing it, we suppress it, but it's actually here. So, how can this be? Where does that place us in the grand scheme of things? What does that say about God's view of our humanity? Well, it says good stuff about. So stop being so hard on yourself. You need to get a revelation of your value, your worth. You know, we talk about our worth often as being, we kind of on the scrap heap, but you know, thank God he threw Jesus' blood in the ring. Just, we weren't really worth saving, but he had pity on us. Nothing is further from the truth. That there is value and has been value from that first day. That when we begin to realize and embrace that value and realize where we sit in the scheme of things, in the great cosmic reality of the goodness of the divine and the greatness of God, it's actually pretty special. So what does, what does all of that say about God's view of our humanity? Well, Romans 4 verse 3 is the New Testament version of a verse I, I, I mentioned to you this morning from Genesis 15 verse 6. And it says this, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Question, I like questions. Was Abraham righteous? Feel free to answer. Was Abraham righteous? Was Abraham sinless? Hang on a minute. So if Abraham was righteous, but Abraham wasn't sinless, that must mean that righteousness and sinlessness are two totally different things and completely unconnected. And that would mean we create problems when we try to cr connect righteousness and sinlessness. So by what means was Abraham declared righteous? He believed God and it counted to him as righteousness. Now, it doesn't say he believed in God or believed there was a God. He embraced the very essence of who this divine being was. And, and I like to put it this way. Abraham believed God was who he said he was and that he, Abraham, was who God said he was. <laughs> And when you believe those two things, that God is who he says he is and I am who God says I am, that's when the revelation of righteousness hits. The problem is, some of you believe God is who he says he is, but you don't believe you are who he says you are. There's the problem right there. So was Jesus righteous? Was Jesus sinless? But was Jesus righteous because he was sinless? The answer to that is a big fat no. Because Abraham wasn't righteous because he was sinless. Abraham was righteous because he believed God was who he said he was and that he was who God said he was. Therefore, Jesus was righteous not because he was sinless, but because he believed God was who God said he was and that he was who God said he was. 
And all of that is expressed in, 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 in Luke chapter 3 and 4 when the baptism of Jesus takes place and he, he's 30 years of age and he hasn't done a miracle and he kind of sort of, kind of a little bit thinks he knows who he is. Now for some of you, you might not get your head around that. But Philippians 2 says he, he laid aside all the vestiges of godliness. In other words, he left back there when he became the word made flesh, all that stuff that made him know who he was. And now, born as a child of Adam into humanity, he has to find out who he is just like you and I have to find out who we are. And so when he gets to his baptism, he's, he's moved a long way along the way. And then he hears a voice and the voice says, you're my son. I love you. I'm pleased with you. Now, now bear in mind, there is no record of Jesus having preached a message, done a miracle. The only thing we know, when he was 12, he pretty much stunned you know, the, the, the theologians in the temple with, with his conversation about his father. But he was still wrestling all that through until that day when he was 30 years of age when he came up out of the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and he heard the voice, you're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. And from that point, he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. From that point, something happened in his life because who he knew God was and who he believed he was, he had grasped. And so in that moment, there was a righteousness that began to flow out of Jesus that manifested in change to the world. So, so Jesus became righteous in the same way that Abraham became righteous. And that righteousness had nothing to do with sinfulness or sinlessness it was actually to do with believing God is who he said he is and, and you are who God says that you are so if I am not righteous because I'm sinless then I am not unrighteous because I am sinful let's say that again if I am not righteous because I am sinless, because that's what we've just understood, then I am not unrighteous because I am sinful. So whatever sin does, it does not impinge upon my condition of righteousness. Now there's one to blow the cobwebs out of you. Because you thought your righteousness was up and down, in and out, big and small, good and bad, by how you behave but the truth is the righteousness you have has never changed and does not shift the moment you believe God is who he says he is and you are who he says you are your behavior may be a project and for some of us it might be a difficult project and a long project but it does not impinge upon who we are in the world in the temple as the righteousness of God So if sinlessness has no connection to righteousness, then sinfulness has no impact on righteousness. Now say, well, what's the point of this? Well, Paul pointed out that this one deviation from truth has shackled the church to a way of thinking that has distorted the gospel and how we present it. A uh, guy who I love to read, he's, he's going to be with the Lord now, uh, he was a Catholic, Brennan Manning. If you've not read any of his books, they're absolutely precious. Brennan said this, We try to dim the blinding brightness of its meaning because the gospel seems too good to be true. And so what we've done is blinded this whole thing down, reconnected righteousness and sinfulness and uh, righteousness and sinlessness and, and unrighteousness and sinfulness. And so we have blinded the brightness of the gospel. So what's interesting about the things that we are questioning and hopefully understanding is that the established church mindset attempts to shame us out of this belief. 
Shame on you. How can you be doing that? You need to be telling people how bad they are, how sinful they are, how condemned they are, how judged they are, you know, and bring them to their knees to, you know, to, to, to plead with the God who is loved to somehow show mercy and kindness on them and pass the sentence of condemnation from off them. And people will shame you when you go here. But here's what Jesus had to say about all this. Think it's good to listen to Jesus had to say about this? Much misunderstood scripture. John 16, I'll begin from verse 8. When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict. Right, now, our best way of understanding convict is in the context of the courtroom. And um, when the judge pronounces a sentence on you because you have been convicted of and so it says that when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, I read that from the New King James. The New International Version is an unmitigated, absolute disaster on this verse. So I'll just tell you if any of you read the NIV. Here's what the NIV does. When he comes... He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. That guilt in regard to is absolutely nowhere in any text of this verse that you can find in all the world ever. It's not there. Sadly, that's an evangelical version of this concept because we don't want you to think that you are totally righteous because then you won't give us your time your bottom on the seat and your money and you won't applaud our intervention for you of keeping you dependent upon us and the church structure so that you can stay quote right with God see see whom the sun sets free <laughs> is free indeed and I hate freedom because I'm a pastor so I want people to be there. I want them to listen. I want them to be amazed and enthralled and desirous of my presence and my incredible wisdom that I pour out. But the problem is when you set people free, they understand the importance of family and friends and neighbors and considering others and doing unto others as you'd have them do to you. And uh, I hate it. But it's true. So sadly, what hasn't happened is we haven't preached the Son who truly sets people free. It's only set them free to move into the corral that we keep them in. You're kind of free, but not free, if you know what I mean. The, the good thing about this is that those who gather and those who come together, you know, are gathering because our hearts are one. Not because our doctrine is one. Not because our theology is one. Not because our fears are one. But because our hearts are one. And we actually start to love one another, so we put ourselves out a little bit, but then we also have grace for people to give them space to be. So when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. I want you to notice something that I missed for years, because I was raised a good evangelical, third generation Pentecostal. Uh, and uh, I realize now that, that what I read is not what I heard. Have you ever done that? What you read is not what you heard. We, um, we had some music on the other night and I'm trying to figure out um, why this person is, is saying, what was it, the, the, oh yeah, why this person was saying, oh hell, <laughs> what's, what's it? It was, no, it was, it was, Jesus, you reign. So I'm thinking, why is this song saying, oh hell, you reign? It was saying all hail, you reign. And I'm like, this is some kind of strange song. Oh hell, you reign. <laughs> see, see some, sometimes, sometimes what we hear is not what we're listening to and what we, what we understand is not what we actually read. I want you to notice this because this is very important. We tend to read he will convict the world of sin, of unrighteousness, and of judgment. 
because we can tie those three together. We're sinful, it's unrighteous, and we will be judged. So we read this scripture and think the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin to make them realize that they are unrighteous so that they will seek to escape judgment. That's what I heard for years, even though I was reading it. But that's not what it says. It says he will convict the world of righteousness, not unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit did not come to convict anybody of unrighteousness. He came to convict them that they were righteous. He came to convict you that you were righteous. And so Jesus explains it. He says, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, he's saying, if there is a sin... That one sin is you don't believe that he is who he says he is. <laughs> and you don't believe that you are who he says you are. Because Jesus is the representation of believing that he is who he says he is and you are who you say you are. Interestingly enough, I know there's, there's the odd verse that says, I only do what I see the Father do, I only say what I hear the Father say. But when you track this story, when Jesus began his ministry... He did not ask the Father what he was supposed to do. He rested in the revelation of the Father telling him who he was. So, so here's the problem. We've been raised with the pressure of what is it that I'm supposed to be? What is it that I'm supposed to do? Rather than who is it that I am? Because the truth of Jesus is when you know who you are, you know what to do. But you'll never find who you are through what you do. So we've got a lot of Christians running around like headless chickens thinking, if I do enough, I'll find out who I am through what I do. And if, you, if you're honest, we never do find that out. But I, I'll guarantee you when you know who you are, there's just this weird thing that you know what to do. Because you know who you are. Rest in who you are. So he explains it in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, i.e. they don't believe that you are who you say you are and that they are who you said they are. And in regard to righteousness, not unrighteousness, because I'm going to the Father. In other words, I'm going to the Father to make sure they all get what's coming to them. In regards to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and believe me, when I see the Father, you're going to get what's coming to you. And what's coming to you is righteousness. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, the system of this world, the culture of this world, the, the essence of all that this world is, is what is judged, and that's what stands condemned, not you. The prince of this world, the system of this world, already judged, not you. There is no judgment for you because once you've been convicted righteous, how can you bring judgment on somebody who's already been convicted righteous? You can't judge them for their sinfulness if you've convicted them of your righteousness. So it works like this, the Holy Spirit acting as God's circuit judge looks at you today and says your name and says you stand accused before me today of multiple offences and having considered all the evidence and facts of this case I declare that you stand convicted righteous and a duly sentenced to be blessed accordingly for the rest of your life. The gavel has come down and you have been convicted righteous. You say, but you don't know my story. You, you don't know my life. Well, listen, once you've come to the court and the judgment has been made and you have been convicted, that's the end of the story. You, you, you're getting sent up, <laughs> not down. So we have been convicted. We've been convicted righteous by, by the divine being himself, yet the church has for centuries been appealing against the sentence. We're going to lodge an appeal against this. How dare you convict us righteous? And we've fingered through our books and gone through our church history and, and at our meetings and conferences to get together so we could lodge an appeal with God to say, you can't say these people are righteous. You can't say I'm righteous. You can't say the world 
is righteous. We demand justice. And God said, justice has already been done. This is a just decision. And it goes all the way back to the image of the God in the temple that flows through the shedding of blood to create something, not to fix something, that comes all the way through the rib at the cross and comes all the way through for this to be spoken by the Holy Spirit to say, I convict you righteous. So conviction, we were always taught, was all about conviction, was that thing of the deep concern of how terrible you were. He's come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, if it's not righteousness that you're feeling, it ain't the Holy Spirit that's convicting you. It's some spirit, but it ain't the Holy Spirit because I've got it right here. I'm going to say in black and white, but it's in red and white. I've got it right here in red and white. So it must be true. It's here in red and white that the Holy Spirit convicts you of righteousness. He's saying, hey, you may be sinful, but sinfulness and righteousness are not the same thing. Just enter into believing I am who I said I am. You are who I've said you are. And just get on with being righteous. Just get on with it. And realize that when you miss the mark, that sinfulness does not impinge upon your righteousness. The worst thing you would ever do does not impinge upon your righteousness. I told you before, God didn't even come down and say, that was really sinful. He says, that was really stupid. Convicted righteous. So let, let, me, let me bring this through to... See, see, the writer of Hebrews made a contribution to this same conversation. And, and here's, what, here's what he, she, they wrote in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. We have much to say about this. But it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again you need milk not solid food now listen, listen to this anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness so immaturity is not doing bad stuff immaturity is when you refuse to embrace the teaching about righteousness. I thought maturity was when you could pick out everybody's sins and point out everybody's failures and condemn yourself for your own failures, but you were never as bad as everybody else because they were always worse sinners than you and you could always see the, the, the splinter in your brother's eye while missing the plank in your own. And we were in all that stuff because all that concerned us was that the subject matter of being a mature Christian is dealing with unrighteousness. When the writer of Hebrews says, no, the mark of maturity is when you become acquainted with the teaching about righteousness and how you have been convicted righteous and you start going and taking conviction into the world and realizing that all these people that you meet have been convicted by the Holy Spirit and they've been convicted righteous and they just need to know it's okay. And that if you believe God is who he says he is and you believe who God says you are, then this is going to break out. So Paul's contribution to this conversation, Romans 1 verse 16 and 17, I'm almost there. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, I'm reading this from the NIV because it, it puts this beautifully. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. Not an unrighteousness of humanity. Not an unrighteousness from humanity, but the, a righteousness from God is revealed. So if the gospel is not revealing a righteousness that breaks out of people's lives, it's probably not the gospel as per Jesus and Paul. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first 
to last. Just as it is written, the, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I was saved by grace through faith. And that was the last bit of being saved by faith in all the understanding. Because then it was, now you better get on and do the right thing. And be the right thing and pray the right way for the right amount of time with the right words, using the right expressions. Don't be praying wrong. You've got to pray to the God, to God the Father, through Jesus the Son, by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't do that, you're not in. And then it was the whole thing of, you know, fasting. And my problem with fasting is it makes me hungry, so I don't really like to do it. That's so. So, so what tended to happen in, in our heritage is that we said to everybody, this is free, God loves you, come in. It's all been done, you don't have to do anything. And then the moment we were in, then there were all the things that we had to do. And, and all of a sudden, we, we had all these unspoken laws. They weren't just spoken laws, because then we could be held to account. They were unspoken laws. But how many of you knew what the laws were, even when they were unspoken? You knew how not to dress. You knew how not to talk. You knew what not to eat. You knew what not to drink. And then this whole hypocrisy thing begins to come out, because we then read verses and quote scriptures that we don't believe. Like, Paul said, the kingdom of God is not a matter of meat and eating and drinking, but it's about righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost which we preached and said amen until we saw somebody eating something we didn't think they should be eating or drinking something we thought they shouldn't be drinking. Then all of a sudden, the kingdom of God is about what you eat and what you drink. Hypocrisy. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. We understood it because of what we believed. It's a reality because of what we believe and it was always be because of what we believe. We believe who he is and we believe who he says that we are. Now, one more comment on this and then, then I'll wrap this up. I thought I am not ashamed of the gospel meant that I had to witness to lots of people about Jesus and that witnessing meant you're a sinner, you're going to hell, God loves you but he's really angry with you and uh, you know, if you don't, say these words then it's curtains for you but it's not just curtains as in that'll be the end of that you're gonna suffer forever and forever and forever and forever your worst nightmare will be never ending but God is love <laughs> how many of you know just just a little thing for you how many of you know that if a debt is paid you cannot be forgiven for that debt Because there's nothing to forgive. So, so we have this idea about the forgiveness of God. God will forgive you if the debt is paid, but then that's not forgiveness. You know, when, when, I, when I finished the mortgage on my, on my house back home in England, the bank are not going to write to me and say, we forgive you of the debt of your mortgage. Because there's nothing to forgive. Therefore, if he forgives us all our sins, if he is the one who forgives us according to his understanding of exactly who we are, then he forgives us in the condition and state that we are without anything having to be done in order to solicit that forgiveness towards us. Forgiveness has to come freely because if forgiveness only comes because you say, sorry, that's not really forgiveness. Because now you've made recompense for what was the problem and I'm not really forgiving you, I'm just recompensing back to you for what you did. You see, we are forgiven whether we say sorry or not. We're forgiven whether we want it or not. Because he forgives from the depths of his heart. The issue is you have been convicted righteous, forgiveness has flown. You just need to come to an awareness of that's who God is and this is who you are. And when that happens... So I thought not being ashamed of the gospel was, you know, you must have the courage to tell your friends about Jesus and how you were saved. 
And that may be important. I'm not saying that that's not important. I think our journeys and our life is important. But certainly not when we're going to heap condemnation on them. And certainly not we're going to, we're going to try and convict them unrighteous rather than righteous. Can you see where the problem comes in here? But you see, Paul's not talking about... I'm not ashamed I will talk to anybody about Jesus. He's saying, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which is a righteousness from God revealed. Because everybody was trying to shame him that his gospel was too accepting, too inclusive, too generous, too forgiving, too loving. It brought the people in who everybody thought should be out. And it included those who they thought were excluded. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of righteousness. Because this is the power of God. And it's a righteousness revealed. Righteousness is not a standard to be achieved. It's a revelation to be received. And all you've got to do is receive the revelation. And when you receive the revelation, you'll stop trying to make it a standard to be achieved. And then you will not be trying to live to something. You'll be living from something. And I believe that's, in essence, where we find ourselves in that the central issue of the gospel is not unrighteousness. So let me drop this in your heart as we close. My identity is son or daughter. My connection is friend. I have called you friends. It's the highest state of relationship. And my condition is righteous. My identity is son. My connection is friend. My condition is righteous. Your job is not to try and live up to a perception of who you think you are supposed to be, but to live from the accepted reality of who you are and I believe it was out of this that Jesus said let your light so shine among men